What is good, everybody? It's me, Mr. Pin, back with more Sea of the Monsters. We're getting ready to start our last chapter of the book. So, I haven't been around as much because on Thursday, I actually had a birthday. I turned 26. And so, um, even though we were inside, my family had some, like, you know, stay at home quarantine festivities that they wanted me to take part of. So, that's what I did. Um, I talked to a lot of people. I got a lot of cool things for uh, for my birthday, and I got to spend it with a lot of people that I love, including my loving fiance, my mother, my brother, and everybody like that. So, sorry, it's been I've been gone for a little while, but I'm back and I'm ready to read the last chapter of the Sea of Monsters. So, in the last chapter, Percy, Annabeth, and Tyson were taking uh, were taking. Um, they were participating, sorry, they were participating in the chariot races. The chariot races is this uh, very, very uh, violent race slash battle that happens back during the old Greek days, during the olden times, where they strap up some horses to a chariot that they, uh, that they trick out themselves, and they battle people while they're racing around a big circle. I think they have to do a couple laps, and whoever is left standing or whoever goes across the finish line wins the race. And so, um, I think towards the end of the book, it was the Hephaestus cabin. He's the god of, like, you know, um, building weapons and th different things like that. Like, he built, he's the one that created the lightning bolt for Zeus. So, it was the Hephaestus cabin, the, uh, Poseidon Athena cabin, which is Annabeth and, um, Percy and Tyson. And then the Ares cabin, which is Clarice. And so Poseidon, if you guys don't remember, is the god of um, water and the ocean. And Ares is the god of war and destruction. And so, uh, and, and we already talked about his Festus, but they were the last three, which makes sense. Because his Festus, uh, the, their cabin, their master builder, so they had a tricked out chariot. And the Ares cab cabin is known for war and precision. And then Poseidon's cabin is, uh, Poseidon created horses, so they knew how to maneuver things as well. So they were neck and neck, and Percy, Annabeth, and Tyson ended up winning. Um, yeah, and so that was a cool thing that happened. It was like a, it was a totally different kind of chapter from like the original, um, chapters from the book because they were dealing with a lot of heavy stuff, but they had finally gotten back to the camp, but they got the uh, fleece back safe and sound, Charon's back safe and sound, and camp seems like it's, uh, back to normal. So, let's see how normal it's going to stay. Chapter 20. The fleece works its magic too well. So, I don't know if I explained the golden fleece. Hold on. So, the golden fleece is something that can... Uh, it's a magical um, a, a sheep skin. Sheep or goat skin. One of the two. That um, is golden. And the magic that it produces is that it can bring things to life and give Lance prosperity. And so camp was in disarray. There were monsters coming in and everything. And they didn't have a protective barrier because Thalia's tree. And Thalia is the daughter of Zeus who um, was about to die in battle. But they preserved her body within a tree. She was protecting camp. But somebody poisoned the tree. And we found out that somebody was Luke. And um, once the tree was poisoned and it was sick... The barrier uh, became open and monsters be began flooding in and cr uh, causing havoc and the campers were in a wave of disarray and didn't know what to do. And so that's why Clarice, Ares, I mean Clarice, um, Percy, Tyson, and Annabeth went on the quest so they could uh, find the fleece so they could uh, cure Thalia's tree so everything can be um, hunky-dory again. So, chapter 20, the fleece works its magic too well. That afternoon was one of the happiest I'd spent at camp, which maybe, which maybe, which maybe goes to show you never know when your world is about to be rocked to pieces. Grover announced that he'd be able to spend the rest of the summer with us before resuming his quest for Pan. His bosses at the Council of Cloven Elders were so impressed that he hadn't gotten himself killed and had cleared the way for future searches that they granted him a two-month furlough and a new set of repipes. The only bad news, Grover insisted on playing those pipes all afternoon long, and his musical skills hadn't improved much. He played YMCA and the strawberry plants started going crazy, wrapping around our feet like they were trying to strangle us. I, I guess I couldn't blame them. 
Grover told me he could dissolve the empathy link between us now that we were face to face, but I told him I'd just assume I'd just assume keep it if they if that was okay with him. Well, these sentences are clunky, or am I reading is clunky? He put down his reed pipes and stared at me. But if I get in trouble again, you'll be in danger, Percy. You could die. If you get in trouble again, I want to know about it. And I'll come help you again, G-Man. I wouldn't have it any other way. In the end, he agreed not to break the link. He went back to playing YMCA for the strawberry plants. I didn't need an empathy link with the plants to know how they felt about it. <laughs> Funny. Later on, during archery class, Kieran pulled me aside and told me if he'd fix my problems with the Merriweather prep. The school no longer blamed me for destroying the gymnasium. The police were no longer looking for me. How did you manage that, I asked. Kieran's eyes twinkled. I merely suggested that the mortals had been had seen something different on that day. A furnace explosion that was not your fault. You just said that and they bought it? I manipulated the mist. Someday when you're ready, I'll show you how it's done. You mean I can go back to Merriweather next year? Kieran raised his eyebrows. Oh no, they've still expelled you. Your headmaster, Mr. Bonsai, said you had... How did you put it? Ungroovy karma that disrupted the school's educational aura. But you're not in any legal trouble, which was a relief to your mother. Oh, and speaking of your mother, he unclipped his cell phone from his quiver and handed it to, handed to me. It's high time you'd called her. The worst part was the beginning. The worst part was the beginning. The Percy Jackson. What were you thinking? Do you have any idea how worried I was sneaking off to camp without permission, going on dangerous quests, and scaring me half to death? <sighs> Part. Ooh, it was one breath. But finally, she paused to catch her breath. Oh, I'm just glad you're safe. That's the great thing about my mom. She's no good at staying angry. She tries, but it's just, it, but it just isn't her nature. I'm sorry, Mom. I told her I won't scare you again. Don't promise me that, Percy. You know very well it will only get worse. She tried to sound casual about it, but I could tell she was pretty shaken up. I wanted to say something to make her feel better, but I knew she was but I knew she was right. Being a half blood, I could always be doing things that scared her, and as I got older the dangers would just get greater. I could come home for a while, I ordered. No no, stay at camp, train, do what you need to do. But you will come home for the next school year. Yeah, of course. Uh if there's any school that will take me, oh we'll find something, dear, my mother sighed. Some place where they don't know us yet. As for Tyson, the campers treated him like a hero. I would have been happy to have him as my cabin mate forever, but that evening, as we were sitting on a sand dune overlooking the Long Island Sound, he made an announcement that completely took me by surprise. Dream came from Daddy last night, he said. He wants me to visit. I wonder if he was kidding, but Tyson really didn't know how to kid. Poseidon sent you a dream message? Tyson nodded. Wants me to go underwater for the rest of the summer. Learn to work at Cyclops Forges. He called, he called it an inter, an intern, an internship. Yes. I let that sink in. I'll admit I felt a little jealous. Poseidon had never invited me underwater, but then I thought Tyson was going. But then I thought Tyson was going. Just like that. When would you leave? I asked. Now. Now, like now, now, now. I stared out the waves in a Long Island Sound. The water was glistening red in the sunset. I am happy for you, big guy, I managed. Seriously. Hard to leave my new brother, he said with a tremble in his voice, but I want to make things weapons for the camp. You will need them. Unfortunately, I knew he was right. The fleece hadn't solved all the camp's problems. Luke was still out there, gathering an army aboard the Princess Andromeda. Kronos was still reforming his golden coffin. Eventually, he would have to uh, fight them. You'll make the best weapons ever, I told Tyson. I hold up my watch proudly. I bet they'll tell good. I bet they'll tell good time too. Interesting. Tyson sniffled. Brothers help each other. You're my brother, I said. No doubt about. No doubt about it. He patted me on the back so hard he almost knocked me down from the sand dune. Then he wiped a tear from his cheek and stood to go. Use the shield well. I will, big guy. Save your life someday. The way he said it, it was so matter of fact. I wondered if that cyclops eye of his could see into the future. He headed down to the beach and whistled. Rainbow, the hippo campers, burst out of the waves. I watched the two of them ride off together in the realm of Poseidon. Once they were gone, I looked down at my new wristwatch. I pressed the button and the shield spiraled out in full size. Hammered it into the bronze were pictures in ancient Greek style, scenes from our adventures this summer. There was Annabeth uh, slaying a Lagostrogenian dodgeball player. 
me fighting the bronze bulls of the Half-Blood Hill, and Tyson riding rainbow toward Princess Andromeda, the CSS Birmingham blasting, into, blasting its cannons at Carabitas. I ran my hand across the picture of Tyson battling the Hydra as he held a soft box of monster donuts. I couldn't help feeling sad. A new Tyson would have an awesome time under the ocean, but I'd missed everything about him. His fascination with horses, the way he could fix chairs or crumple metal with his bare hands or tie bad guys into knots. I'd even miss snoring like an earthquake in the next bunk all night. Hey, Percy. I turned. Annabeth and Grover were standing at the top of the sand dune. I guess maybe I had some sand in my eyes because I was blinking a lot. Tyson, I told them. He... He, he had to. We know, Annabeth said softly. Kieran told us. Cyclop forges, Grover shuddered. I hear the cafeteria food there is terrible, like no enchiladas at all. Hm. Annabeth held out her hand. Come on, seaweed brain, time for dinner. We walked back toward the dining pavilion together. Just the three of us, like old times. A storm raged that night, but it parted around Camp Half-Blood as storms usually did. Lightning flashed against the horizon, the waves pounded the shore, but not a drop fell in our valley. We were protected again thanks to the fleece, sealed inside our magical borders. Still, my dreams were restless. I heard Kronos taunting me from the depths of Tartus. Polyphemus sits blindly in his cave, young hero, believing he has won a great victory. Are you any less deluded? The titan's cold laughter filled the darkness. Then my dream changed. I was following Tyson to the bottom of the sea into the court of Poseidon. It was a radiant hall filled with blue light and floor cobbled with pearls, and there on the throne of pearls sat my father, dressed like a simple fisherman in khaki shorts and sun-bleached t-shirt. I looked up into his tan-weathered face, his deep green eyes, and he spoke two words. Brace yourself. I woke with a start. There was a banging on the door. Grover flew inside without waiting for my permission. Percy, he stammered. Annabeth. On the hill, she... The look in his eyes told me something was terribly wrong. Annabeth had been on guard duty that night, protecting the fleece. If something had happened, I ripped off the covers, my blood like ice water in my veins. I threw on some clothes while Grover tried to make a complete sentence, but he was too stunned to, to out of breath. She's lying there, just lying there. I ran outside and raced across the central yard. Grover right behind me. Don was just breaking about the whole, was just breaking, but the whole camp seemed to be stirring. Word was spreading. Something huge had happened. A few campers were already making their way toward the hill. Satyrs and nymphs and heroes in weird mix of armor and pajamas. I heard the clop of horse hooves and Kieran gall galloped up behind us looking grim. Is it true? He asked Grover. Grover could only nod, his expression dazed. I tried to ask what was going on, but Kieran grabbed me by the arm and, effort and effortlessly lifted me onto his back. Together we thudded up Half Blood Hill, where a small crowd had started to gather. I expected to see the fleece missing from the pine tree, but it was still there, glittering in the first light of dawn. So a storm had broken and the sky was blood red. Curse the Titan Lord, Charon said. He's tricked us again, giving himself another chance to control the prophecy. What do you mean? I asked. The fleece, he said. The fleece did its work too well. Hmm. We galloped forward, everyone moving out of our way. There at the base of the tree, a girl was lying unconscious. Another girl in Greek armor was kneeling next to her. Blood roared in my eyes. I couldn't think straight. Annabeth had been attacked, but but why was the fleece still there? The tree itself looked perfectly fine, whole and healthy, suffused with the essence of, of the golden fleece. It healed the tree, Caron said, his voice ragged, and poison was not the only thing it purged. Then I realized Annabeth wasn't the one lying on the ground. She was the one in armor kneeling next to the unconscious girl. When Annabeth saw us, she ran to Caron. It, she... Just suddenly there, her eyes were streaming with her te was streaming with tears, but I couldn't tell. I, but I still didn't understand. I was too freaked out to make sense of it all. I leaped off Kieran's back and ran towards the unconscious girl. Kieran said, "Percy, wait." I knelt by her side. She had short black hair and freckles across her nose. She was built like a long distance runner, lithe and strong, and she wore clothes that were somewhere between punk and goth. A black t-shirt, black tattered jeans, and a leather jacket with buttons from a bunch of bands I'd never heard of. She wasn't a camper. I didn't recognize her from any of the cabins, and yet I had the strangest feeling I'd seen her before. It's true, Grover said, panting from his run up the hill. I can't believe nobody else came close to the girl. I put my hand on her forehead. Her skin was cold, but my fingertips tingled as if they were burning. 
She needs nectar and ambrosia, I said. She was clearly a half-blood, whether she was a camper or not. I could sense that just from one touch. I didn't understand why everyone was acting so scared. I took her by the shoulder and lifted her into, into sitting position, resting her head on my shoulder. Come on, I yelled to the others. What's wrong with you people? Let's get her back, let's get her back to the big house. No one moved, not even Kieran. They were all too stunned. Then the girl took a shaky breath. She coughed and opened her eyes. Her irises were startlingly blue. Electric blue. The girl stared at me in bewilderment, shivering and wild-eyed. Who? I'm Percy, I said. You're safe now. Strangest dream. It's okay. Dying. No, I assured her. You're okay. What's your name? That's when I knew. Even before she said it, the girl's blue eyes stared into mine and I understood. What the Golden Fleece quest had been about. The poisoning of the tree. Everything Kronos had done, done it. Everything. Kronos had done it to bring another chess piece into play. Another chance to control the prophecy. Even Kieran, Annabeth, and Grover, who should have been celebrating this moment, were too shocked, thinking about what it might mean for the future. And I was holding someone who was destined to be my best friend, or possibly my worst enemy. I am Thalia, the girl said, daughter of Zeus. <laughs> so, the Sea of Monsters is done. The next book is The Titan's Curse. Tune in tomorrow, and I will have a video posted for the Titans Curse. You guys have a good one, and hope you guys tune in. Bye.